Yeah, it's really good. That's fun. Lovely, right. So, hello, everybody, and thank you very much for um, joining us this evening. Um, I'm Emily, and I'm going to be hosting um, the, the meeting. Um, I am going to share my screen. Right. So, um, just a couple of housekeeping bits um, and bobs. So, it's Freedom for Efficiency, the meeting this evening. Um, and housekeeping. So if everybody could mute themselves, that would be fantastic. Um, if not, then I am able to, if you're not sure how to, um, I am able to go through and just put individuals on mute if, if I need to. Um, we will be taking questions throughout the throughout Victoria's um, session. So if you um, see this um, little hand signal, that's how you pop your hand up and I will um sort of intervene and then ask whoever's put their hand up to ask a question um we are now recording as well so this will be going on to the small scale um producer hdb web pages and um onto the bpa website um and then to ask a question you should see um a little box like this just press the arrow and that will come through um, and then you can also register your attend attendance on Pig Pro as well um, as sort of um, to, to record your training, well, training, the session that you've attended. Um, right, so Victoria, um, oh, there will, will also, sorry, be some polls, um, but they're quite self-explanatory when they pop up. Um, but if anyone has any trouble, then do pop it in the um, chat function and I will be able to see. Okay. So okay, shall, I, shall I share my feet. screen? Over to you. Okay, lovely. Thanks, Emily. Right, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. I know everyone's very busy. Um, so it's lovely to see you all. My name is Victoria Phillips. Uh, Emily and Marcus have kindly asked me to take this session tonight. I'm a nutritionist, so I've worked as an animal nutritionist for 25 years now in the animal feed industry. Um, and more recently, I, uh, I do consultancy in nutrition, feed safety, anything really, anything to do with animal feed. So it's real nice to be here and to have a look looking at feeding for efficiency with you all tonight. So my plan is to cover sort of three three things really. We're going to start by looking at some key nutrients in pig nutrition and the reason why I've done this really is to give you just a little bit of background into the different types of nutrients that I'm going to be talking about as the session unfolds. So we're going to talk about factors that will affect the feed intake and then looking towards the end at carcass composition, um, looking at growth curves, just I've got some sort of simple examples of some rations so that we can look at what happens when we change rations, when we feed certain types of material and the effect that that has on carcass composition. And we've got some lovely pictures that have been supplied by uh, a lady called Jane Matthews, who maybe is coming tonight or next week. I'm not sure, but she's one of your members. Some very happy pigs. So, Emily, can you start by setting the pole away and this was just really for my information do, do i can you do it or do i have to stop sharing no that's fine i should okay, be able brilliant. to um launch that now um, and it's really just for my information um to find out how you how you're feeding your pigs are you feeding commercial feed are you home mixing or are you doing a bit of both? And I'm not, if you can just have a go at completing that poll. Give me a couple of minutes to do that. And then. So just to say that the results 
will be shared just so we've got an idea of who's on the call but they are anonymous so we, nobody can see if it what you've voted if you, if the results are there Emily do you want to read them out because I'm not sure I can see them with sharing my screen um, okay so can you see that at the moment has it popped up no okay so um we've had three votes and it's 100 percent commercial feed okay so no supplementation no mixing just commercial feed okay great mm -hmm. so let's start by just looking at when we talk about feed um what are, what are we interested in what sort of factors in that feed are we interested in so anything that we feed is made up of the water fraction and the dry matter fraction. And so depending on what kind of feed you're feeding, there could be quite a lot of water in there. Or if it's a, a sort of a drier cereal based feed, then there'll be less water in there and more dry matter. And the dry matter is really the bit that we're interested in. Within the dry matter fraction, we have both the organic and the inorganic fractions. And we're going to talk about some of these key nutrients tonight because in order to exp to have the discussion about carcass composition we sort of need to understand what what we mean when we talk about these nutrients so we're going to talk about proteins and we're actually going to talk about essential amino acids specifically when we look at the protein content of feed we're going to talk about energy we're going to talk about the carbohydrates and the, the fats and oils that make up the energy content of feed uh, and we'll touch a little bit on the, the vitamins and the inorganic fraction which is the minerals as well so i always like to explain feed as being like a car that you can drive down the street so the protein fraction is the bits you can see it's the metal on the doors it's the rubber on the tires it's the metal in the engine the energy is the fuel you can't really see it, but without it, the car won't move, the car won't work. And the vitamins and minerals are like the oil that goes into the gearbox, and the water that goes into the radiator. Uh, it's needed in small amounts, but without it, the car won't drive. And so what we're going to look at, we're going to look at the impact of these different nutrients on growth rate, on carcass composition, uh, and, and, and look at, at the importance of all of them. So I want to just start with proteins. And as I said, the reason I'm going into this kind of detail is because when we start looking at carcass composition, I'll be talking about protein content. I'll be talking about amino acids. And so I just wanted to give you a simple definition of what we mean. So as I said, the protein is the building blocks, if you like. They are the bits you can see. That's the muscle and the tissues and the hair and the skin. Proteins are also used, the bits you can't see, for example, hormones used in, in reproduction. Uh, enzymes are, are proteins as well. So a protein, as you can see in this diagram here, is quite simply a chain of what we call amino acids. And each protein has a defined structure made up of a number of amino acids in a set pattern. One thing that stands out on proteins is it has a, a nitrogen group. Don't want to worry too much about that, but we will be touching on nitrogen later when we talk about potentially overfeeding protein and the effects that that can have on pollution, for example. So a nitrogen group attached to a chain of amino acids that make up the building blocks of the body. So there are 25 amino acids or their precursors. And when we eat protein, when the pigs eat protein, then we are eating a, a, a range of these amino acids or the precursors. Some of these amino acids can be synthesized by the pig. Some of them can be made from other amino acids. But for monogastric animals like pigs and also us as humans, poultry, for example, then 10 of these amino acids must be supplied in the diet 
they are what we call essential amino acids. So you may have heard of some of these. There are, for example, lysine. Is anybody else having is anybody else having trouble with Victoria's um here in Victoria or is that just maybe my connection? Can anyone hear? I can hear it fine. It's crystal clear for me, Emily. Sandra. Okay, sorry, carry on. Sorry, no, that, it no it's fine, Emily. Honestly, step in at any point because when you're talking, you don't actually know if you've gone off. <laughs> so that's fine. No problem. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so Lovely, you, sorry. That, that's fine. So you may you may have heard of some of these more common amino acids like lysine and methionine, for example. Maybe not heard so much of some of the others, but these are the 10 amino acids that we would class as being essential in a diet. We must feed a source of these amino acids in the diet. The animals cannot make these amino acids by what we call transamination, i.e. moving the amine group, moving the nitrogen group. You can't make lysine, for example, out of valine. That's what we mean by essential. So I just want to just show you a little sort of diagram of what that means in real life. So this is a, this, for example, is the amino acid pattern template, if you like, for let's say it's a particular muscle protein. It could be hair, it could be a tissue, it could be a hormone, it could be an enzyme, could be any of those things. But for example, it's a muscle protein. And you can see that the amino acids are laid down in a precise pattern that can't be interchanged. We can't replace one for the other. The, the round empty circles are the non-essential amino acids, the ones that can be made by the animal. They can actually, so for example, the pig could possibly turn lysine into glycine or something like that. So we're not too worried about them. We're worried about the essential amino acids. And so you can see that this particular muscle protein needs a histidine, a lysine, a tryptophan, lysine, alanine, phenylalanine. Don't worry about the words. You can see the different colours and you can see that in order to produce this particular muscle protein, which effectively means for the animal to grow, then we need to have all of these coloured amino acids present in the diet. And so this is in the animal's body. This is the range of amino acids that potentially are floating around in the blood. These are the amino acids that have come from the diet. So when the animal eats the protein, breaks down that chain, into the individual amino acids, then they're all available in the blood to be taken wherever they're needed to then put back together in this precise template. And so if you can just follow me with this, we've got a histidine, we've got a lysine, we've got a tryptophan, we've got plenty of non-essential amino acids filling these gaps, we've got another lysine, we've got a phenylalanine then, we've got a methionine, this nice green one, We've got another tryptophan and a valine and a leucine and another tryptophan and an isoleucine and another lysine and a threonine. And so it goes until we get to, for example, the second methionine. This pattern needs another methionine and there isn't enough methionine in this diet. This There are no spare methionine molecules floating about in the blood. And what that means is the animal then can't manufacture this protein. They can't say, well, I'm, I've got loads of spare histidine, for example, so I'll turn that into methionine. That's not possible because they can't make that through that, that transamination process. And so if we try and fit, we try and get so far, the animal will can potentially try and put this muscle protein together when it gets to the methionine and realizes that it's missing one then the whole muscle protein is will not be finished and then it has to be then broken down back into its essential amino acids and and wasted yeah if there's if there isn't that that key essential amino acid there then 
we can't make the protein. And those amino acids then have to utilise energy to then be broken down. They have to be taken to the liver and the kidney where that amine group has to be deaminated. And all of that costs energy. All because we were just a little bit short of methionine. All of the other amino acids were there and some of them very plentiful. No, and pro protein's important. Protein's expensive and, you know, there are limited sources of protein in the world. So what a shame that we've lost or wasted, if you like, all of those essential amino acids just because we didn't have enough methionine. And so what you're doing when we're feeding pigs, we're looking to try and balance this dietary amino acid supply with the requirements for whatever the pig's doing. So whether it's hormonal, whether it's enzymes, whether it's growth through muscle protein, whether it's laying down hair, for example. The, the closer we can get to this supply, then the less wastage we have, but we can still maximise growth, maximise fertility, maximise that deposition if you like, of amino acids. So when we come, when we talk later and we look at growth curves and we look at protein content, just try, try and re imagine that sign that all of those amino acids without the methionine actually cost energy to be wasted. So when you're looking at feeding the pigs and you're, what you're looking for is to try and feed the balance of these essential amino acids, not just something that's high in protein, but something that is providing the essential amino acids in as far as, as close as you can, in, in the, the proportions that we need that match the pig's requirement. So we can feed soya, we can feed rapeseed meal. Both of those vegetable proteins tend to be quite low in amino, essential amino acids, particularly lysine. So by, by feeding a diet based on just soya, just rapeseed meal, in order to achieve the minimum essential amino acids, we have to feed quite a lot of those type of proteins because there's always going to be that sort of rate determining factor that one of the essential amino acids could be quite low and it's usually lysine. We can feed fish meal, and fish meal is a very good source of essential amino acids. And um, we can also feed linseed as well, which again is a bit more like soya and rapeseed, a bit lower in essential amino acids. And this is a good point to just reiterate that there are um, lots of proteins that we can't feed, that it's illegal to feed. So most animal byproducts can't be fed to food producing animals. There are a couple of exceptions. So pasteurised milk and eggs, for example, when they've been um, effectively, if you were feeding bread, for example, there might be a touch of egg glaze or a little bit of milk in there, pasteurised milk, and that's fine. But no meat or meat derivatives, um, no catering waste, and so nothing that has come for a kit from a kitchen. Um, even if that's your own kitchen. We're not allowed to feed any of those type of um, materials to the pigs. So we are left with quite a limited supply or limited range of um, protein sources that we have to feed. So if you're buying commercial feed, then it should be balanced. It will be based on soya and maybe fish meal, and it will be balanced with some synthetic amino acids. So we can buy lysine, we can buy methionine, we can add that in to give exactly the right amount needed to meet the animal's requirements. If we're not feeding um, commercially or if you are feeding commercially but then adding something to the diet, maybe supplementing it with something, then that's when we start to change, if you like, that fine amino acid balance. Victoria, it's Andrew O'Shea here. Can I ask a question in regards to the 
illegal feed side of things. Yes. One thing I, I see quite common that happens, and this is a question I did post to Zoe Davis from the uh, National Pig Association, but, you know, people seem to think it's fine to go into super... Oh, I've lost her. Sorry, see, I, I missed a little bit of that, Andrew. See that? Sorry, yeah. So, so people seem to assume that they can go into the supermarket and buy the... You sort of the reduced apples and the, you know, the the end of life edge that they're just trying to sort of sell cheap and feed that to their pigs. Now, my argument would, has always been that you know, it's in a supermarket. It's a store that sells proteins as well. So there's no guarantee that, you know, those those items would be protein free from meat products or fish products or whatever. Um, and I just wonder what your sort of view on that was. From a legal perspective, I know, um, I know that Zoe said to me that um, you know they are, the, the, the NPA are pretty much against it, but it's not actually sort of illegal per yeah. se. Yeah, you know, and, I find that quite, quite, sort of slightly frustrating that, that sort of people do that kind of approach to feeding their animals. I would agree. It's not. It's not illegal. It does present hazards. Of course, it does, especially if the supermarkets have have maybe segregated it down the line from other materials the, the rule is if it's been in contact with meat or meat derivatives it can't be fed if there is a, a sort of a an understanding that it hasn't been in contact with meat then yeah legally it can be fed it hasn't come from a kitchen it hasn't come from the sort of the definition of a kitchen so it's not a catering waste it is actually a feed and they, they buy it and turn it into yeah food. i agree um, i just think legally there there's a um you know it's probably a, a discussion for a, a different time but um i think there's a gap there in the legalities around um what people think they can feed their their pigs I and mean, you and you see people taking in packets of biscuits and feeding their pigs biscuits and stuff like that <laughs> you know and it's just like you know in my opinion wrong but again not illegal no, so, not, isn't it? It's not illegal. No, no, no. Anyway, sorry to interrupt your flow. I just oh, I'm, you're fine. You're fine. Oh, not at all. Well, it's always good to have that discussion. I think it's always it's always a good a good discussion to have. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Andrew. Okay, so just we're talking about we're going to talk about protein, and in particular, we're going to talk about essential amino acids and and the supply of essential amino acids. Another thing we're going to talk about is the energy supply. So when we when we feed animals again, the energy is a measurement of what the, the, the total amount of energy in a diet we would consider to be the, the gross amount of energy. How much energy is available to the animal or how much energy is in the feed when we feed it to the animal? Remember, the energy is like the petrol in the car. It's what makes everything work. When we when we feed pigs, we actually look at a slightly different measurement of energy. So we look at digestible energy. We're measuring the energy as the gross energy, total amount in the feed, minus any energy that is lost in feces. So anything that hasn't been digested effectively is taken out. And we measure energy as this digestible energy in terms of megajoules per kilogram of feed. Okay. Energy, if we, if we feed too much energy, then it's stored as fat. So it's not like the proteins where they can get rid of them. It takes energy to get rid of protein. But as I said, it's taken to the liver and the kidney where it's deaminated and excreted. With energy, it's, it's not excreted. It's laid down as fat. And so again, we're going to look at energy supply and how to get that balance, how to get that final carcass composition, which has just got the, the required amount of fat. I wanted to men mention essential fatty acids. So these might be things that you've heard of maybe in, in human nutrition. Um, certain types of fats are considered to be essential. It's a bit like the proteins. Some can be made by the body, but there are certain essential fatty acids that um, must be supplied in the diet. OK, so essential fatty acids, actually, they, they can't be synthesized by the animal. Um, or well, these ones can't anyway. So we're looking at the omega-6 fatty acids uh, and the omega-3 fatty acids, which you might have heard of in 
um, in human nutrition. These have a key role. They're not just supplied for energy. They, you, you, you may have heard of um, omega-3s being uh, recommended for um, certain conditions, for things like fertility, for example, in, uh, in, in human nutrition. Um, these are the key essential amino acids that we also have to supply in the diet. And if we don't supply them, then we will see deficiencies. So deficiencies result in growth and development retardation. So we would see lower growth. We might have the right amount of energy. We might have the right combination of amino acids. But if we haven't got some of these key essential fatty acids, then you can see growth retardation, increased susceptibility to bacterial infections, infertility, um, all just because some of these essential fatty acids are missing. Um, things like soy oil, sunflower oil, rapeseed oil, linseed, whole linseed or, and fish oil are all very good sources of essential fatty acids. And again, if you buy a commercial feed, then that feed will be balanced with the correct levels of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. If we are supplementing feed, if we're whole mixing or if we're um, feeding other feeds alongside the, the commercial feed, then this again is where we perhaps start to reduce the levels of these essential fatty acids in, in our diet. And depending on what level of supplementation you're getting, you may just start to see perhaps a slight increased susceptibility to bacterial infections, maybe a slight reduction in the growth rate. And then the last couple of things to look at, I mentioned about the vitamins and minerals being like the engine oil and the water in the gearbox. Constituents of the diet required in small amounts, but is essential to the life and well-being of an animal. So we have to, for, for pigs, we have to ensure that we give them all of the required vitamins and also the, the minerals, the trace elements that they require as well. And we're not going to really look at this in a lot of detail, but it's again, it's just coming back to, we could we could have a, a diet that is perfectly balanced in protein and essential amino acids, and also with the correct amount of energy. But if one of these are missing, then again, that can have, I'll show you a picture in a minute, but severe effect on growth, on fertility, and on, on, on the health of the animal as well. And if, if you put all those essential amino acids in, but you haven't got some of these key things, then again, the result is that the animal doesn't grow and the, the essential fatty acids are effectively wasted and excreted. An essential mineral is defined as, if you don't feed it, the animal will get deficiency symptoms. It's a little bit vague, but that's, that's how we define a mineral. So just wanted to... Um, sorry, what? Victoria, we've got another question. Um, on yeah, fine. one of them was um, why are minerals classed as inorganic and I think you've just um, answered that one and then I think we've got another one from Andrew yes yeah, sorry, sorry to keep asking questions but um, yeah, fine I don't mind at all when it comes to mixing feeds I know there's you know when you as part of your requirements as registering with trading standards etc you're required to register as a certain business if you're selling your your meat onwards. I believe for mixing fees, there are other legalities that we're that you're required to um, obtain, but I'm not clear on what they are. So, you know, um, if you're buying in mineral additives to put with the feed that you're mixing yourself, it it gets a bit complicated. And I, I didn't know if you had any more information on that. That might be something if you if you're interested that we could come back to because it's quite complicated. The the legislation is around feed hygiene rather than nutrition, so it they wouldn't be looking, for example, whether you'd balance the amino acids or supplied essential fatty acids. It would be more around if there was any feed safety issues around mixing. Um, and yeah, there are if you were using sort of a, a mineral mixture that was very concentrated, then they would expect you to do things like mixer dispersion tests and those kind of things. But I think it's something that we could certainly look at 
um, if if there are a number of people who are for mixing. Yeah, no, no, yeah, well, no. I mean, I mean, I've tried before to an extent just blending different grains, really, and uh, had some sort of mixed results. But it was just really when you, you know, I think you're required to register as an R13 business if you've got you know, small scale producers producing pork. Um, you know, but if you want to buy in. I was just interested as to whether it was the fact that you were buying in these minerals to add, but from what you're saying, it's, it comes back down to again to like you know food food health and, and hygiene yeah. And, yeah. And, and in the way that you're mixing it rather than what you're mixing. So yeah, thank it, you. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay, good. Yeah, but it's, it's it's certainly something we could look at in the future. So just a couple of things with this. One thing, couple of things I want to bring to your attention: B vitamins. Just like humans, they need a daily source of B vitamins. So we would, in that diet, we're looking to make sure that we are supplying the full complement of B vitamins, B1, B2, B6, B12, and some of the others as well. Things the, the A and D and E are important, but you don't need a daily supply of them. And likewise with the minerals, they're more long-term storage type minerals. Um, but certainly the B vitamins is the one that we would be, I'd be most looking at to ensure that we didn't, um, somehow feed a deficient amount of B vitamins. And I've just put this little slide up here just to show you what how important these are. Even though they're very small and needed in tiny amounts, I've just picked zinc as an example. So let's say you were feeding a diet that was deficient in zinc. It had a lovely balance of amino acids, essential amino acids, and the energy was right, and it had the essential fatty acids and all of the vitamins, but it was deficient in zinc. Then this little pig here has... It should be the size of that one. But because of the zinc deficiency, and this would have been done under controlled environments, so everything else would have been the same. But that, due to just simply a lack of zinc, this little pig is probably only half the size that it should have been, that it could have been, uh, that, you know, if it had been fed correctly with a balanced diet, that it could have achieved. Zinc's essential in the, in the proteins. So we talked about laying down the amino acids, and zinc would be an essential component in that reaction. Um, and also very much involved in things like skins, um, hooves and wool, if, if it's hair, if you like, for, for sheep, but also important in the immune response and in reproduction as well. Things like sperm production, for example, zinc's very important in that. And a deficiency would be, you'd see scabby feet, foot abnormalities, which you might notice, but you know, that, that reduced growth, quite simply just because one key component of this diet was missing all of the other nutrients are effectively wasted. And you, I could show you pictures, I have other pictures that I could show you where key B vitamins are missing as well and certain other trace elements and minerals are missing. Um, all having a, a detrimental effect on overall health and overall growth rates. So that's all the nutrients. Now we've just got to get it into them in the right quantities and feed intake, voluntary feed intake, we could call it actually getting them to eat. What, ma what makes the pigs eat? Okay, so there's a couple of different, there's three or four different factors, if you like, that will affect the feed intake of the pigs. Okay, so I just, I'm just going to touch on these again, just to think about it as we as we sort of go through this, this session. There are certain metabolic factors that will um, govern what a pig will eat. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. They have receptors in um, certain tissues in their body, which, which can detect high levels of energy, for example, or low levels of energy. And will will get the pig to eat more based on that those receptors. There's also, to a certain extent, some digestive factors around how much room's inside the pig. Although generally speaking, that doesn't tend to be too much, too, too um, big a factor. We talk about the availability of feed and also the animal health as well. So I've just pulled up a couple of key points here. Um, pigs will eat to meet primarily their energy requirements. Yeah, they have, they have a, a requirement for energy. And the, the first metabolic factor is they will eat to try and achieve that energy requirement. And then after that, they will eat to meet their protein requirements as well, and effectively their essential amino acid requirements. 
usually you can't they they won't usually eat enough till they can't eat any more. I know that sounds strange, but they'll eat ad lib. We can feed pigs ad lib. You know, there are certain animals you can't feed ad lib because they would just keep eating and eating, but that's not the case with pigs. They they'll eat to to achieve this. The only times when digestive controls may be a key factor is where you've got dry sows that have got a very high gut capacity, but they don't need a lot of energy. And sometimes then they can feel hungry. And we can feed things like sugar beet, um, straw, very bulky, low energy feeds to, to give them that gut fill. But everything else usually ad lib. If we talk about actually the availability of food and environmental controls. The smart buttons. Oh. oh. Someone having a party? Sorry, I've just put um, I just put the, the new rival on mute. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like a good party. Um, yeah, so environmental controls. If your animals are housed, then things like temperature, for example, weather don't usually affect the feed, the, the feed intake too badly. If we're talking about outdoor pigs, then the temperature can quite significantly affect feed intake. Um, and I've just got a slide to show you on that one. Actually, I'll just jump forward to show you this. So we talk about we talk about lower critical temperatures. OK, when we talk about a lower critical temperature, we're talking about the environmental temperature below which heat production is increased. So these are the lowest the lowest temperature before the animal starts to utilize feed for heat rather than for growth, reproduction, lactation or whatever. And you can see that the, the critical temperature is quite high for a growing pig on straw. It's 14 degrees C, but if it's on concrete, then that lower critical temperature uh, raises up to 19 degrees. So 19 degrees, anything below that, the animal will be use, utilizing extra feed for heat production. And in, in a big commercial um, herds and certainly in, in poultry as well, they, they're always measuring right, what's the cost of energy to heat a shed versus what's the cost of energy in feed. And it can sometimes be very close. For an adult sow on straw, that lower critical temperature is 22 degrees. So when the, if they are outside, then potentially they could be utilising quite a lot of their feed and a lot of their energy for heat production. If they're inside, then they won't be using so much of that. You can add flavours. Pigs love flavours. Um, you can add flavours. Not A lot of animals can't taste flavours, but young pigs can, and you can add that to um, encourage intake. And in, in where you've got ill or injured, Ill or injured. they potentially are going to um, not be able to go and compete for feed or achieve feed. Someone, someone else having a party there? Sorry, I've just muted Chris as well. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> okay, so as I've said, pigs will choose to eat to satisfy their energy and protein requirements, energy being the first, but then the protein being the second. And what I've got to show you now is just a trial that was done many years ago that showed how clever these pigs are, Although, you know, it's how, how they can actually choose the feeds that will meet their protein requirement. So if you could just look at this little table here, this was a, a trial that was done on six different groups of pigs, all fed the same energy content. But what they did was they, they gave them two options. They gave them two different diets separated in the pen so that they could choose which, how much of each diet they would like to eat. And so we've got what was here. So a, a, a diet that was very low in protein with a, a medium option and a diet that was low in protein with a high option and a diet that was low in protein with a very high option. And then we had a medium and a high and a medium and a very high and then a high and a very high. OK, so they were given the different options to eat as much or as little of these two different diets as they wished. And you can see that in this middle section here, 
generally speaking, they were all eaten roughly about the same thing, about the same amount. Here, this is probably the maximum amount that they could eat to meet that energy requirement. Um, but they were trying to eat the protein as well. You can see there that they ate significantly more of the higher protein diet. But even with eating more than that, they didn't really achieve overall a very high protein content in, in their daily ration. If you look at the bottom one, they were desperately trying not to eat the very high protein content. The 98% was the lowest protein that they could eat. And even then, it was probably a little bit high, but but there wasn't a really, there wasn't a, a different option that that was the lowest that they could go. And if you look at the others, they very nicely regulated themselves so that the overall protein content in the diet was pretty much around about the 20 and a half percent. Feed intake again was very sort of even among that, but they, the, the, the proportions of the different diets did vary quite significantly as they balanced out that, that protein requirement. So that would tell me that this is optimal, if you like, this is the optimal balance, um, whichever way you do it, for that pig or that group of pigs at that particular stage in their lives. And we're looking for feeding for efficiency here. We're looking to um, get the most from the least. We're looking at feed conversion ratios, measuring an animal's efficiency in converting their feed mass into increasing body mass. So we can measure that. How much feed have we put in? How much meat have we got out? How much gain have we got out? So as a measurement of efficiency, we take the amount of food eaten. So, for example, a 20 kilo pig eats 852 grams of feed per day, gains 630 grams of body weight per day with a feed conversion ratio of that divided by that to give us 1.35. 1.35 kilos of feed in, one kilo of growth out. And we're trying to maximise that all the time. We're trying to get best feed conversion ratios, because that's how we ensure that we're not wasting protein or overfeeding a particular nutrient. And we have in our commercial feeds, I know some of you are buying commercial feed. So with our commercial diets, we have a number of different diets that will feed the pigs at different stages in their lives. So we have the creep feed if you like, for the very young piglets who are still taking mother's milk. And a link that links the, the milk-based diet with the cereal-based diet. And potentially, we could have a weaner and a grower, maybe one or two different finishers. You can see that as they get older, the feed conversion ratio increases. We have to put more in to get that one kilo of live weight gain. And that just happens naturally. There's a genetic control. We, we can, the best we can do is to try and achieve that. If we're feeding inefficiently, if we're not getting the balance of protein right, if we're not getting the energy right, if we're missing zinc, if we're missing vitamin B2, then you can see how we could put more and more feed in and get very little growth. And this feed conversion will start to increase significantly. We know what potential feed conversion ratios are, are achievable. So we can measure your feed intake, measure your growth and just see, you know, how, it's a measurement of efficiency, if you like, about how close you are to these feed conversion ratios. And I just want to start looking at the pattern of growth. So you can see with this graph here, all, all animals grow in this in this way. OK, so. We have, we're, we're looking at live weight up the side and we're looking at the age of the animal across the bottom. And we start off very small because they have to get out either of an animal or of an egg. And then from birth or hatching, if it's a chicken, we get exponential growth. We get very fast growth and then eventually that will even off so that we won't grow any more. Like me, no matter how much feed you feed me, I won't grow any, any taller. So this line is controlled by genetics and the best that we can do 
is feed correctly to achieve that growth. We could underachieve by not feeding correctly. We can't grow higher than genetics will allow. But we can maximise the potential growth by ensuring that the, all of those nutrients are there to, for, the, for the animal to grow to its genetic potential. And I just want to break that down and, and show you this graph here. So it's the same graph, if you like. You've got live weight up the side and age along the bottom. But this time we're looking at not total live weight gain, but the percentage of live weight gain that is laid down in three different types of tissue. So the red line shows the percentage of live weight gain that makes up the bone content of an animal. The yellow line shows the percentage of live weight gain that makes up the protein content of the animal. So that's the muscle tissue, the skin, the organs, any hair, any um, hooves, nails, etc. And the green line shows the percentage of live weight gain that is used to lay down fat. And so you can see as the animal gets older, as the animal starts to mature, the propensity to lay down bone fades away. No matter, like I said, no matter how much feed you give me, I'm not going to grow any taller. The propensity to lay down protein eventually starts to fade away. Yeah. This, this is the genetic potential, if you like, of the animals that we're feeding. And as they get to adulthood, they will eventually stop laying down protein. Once they've filled out and laid down that, that muscle tissue, we're just talking about replenishing protein, not accumulating protein. But you can see the green line. The green line shows the fat deposition, which is actually very low to start with when the animals are in the womb and when they're young. We don't want to take up room with fat. We need minimal amounts of fat. The important thing for a young animal is bone. And as they get a bit older, then protein. Fat just takes up room. So it's quite difficult to get to make a very young animal over fat because they don't want to lay down fat. They want to use their nutrients and their energy to lay down bone and to lay down protein. But as they mature, you can see that the propensity to lay down fat becomes easier and easier until eventually it takes over. And so what we're doing when we're feeding animals, somewhere between birth and adulthood, there is just the right balance of protein to energy, yellow line to green line, or protein to fat, if you like. Okay, And in order to achieve carcass composition, we have to slaughter the animals at just the right point in their maturity where the fat to lean is the correct proportion for whatever the market is. Okay, Which probably sits, I think it's on another graph, but it's probably sitting somewhere around about here. Okay, But that itself can vary within the different breeds. So, for example, it, it depends on how how the animal matures as to how far along this graph you can take them before the carcass becomes over fat. If you've got a late maturing animal, you can actually take them further along this maturity line and to achieve that that perfect carcass composition. If you've got an early maturing animal and most of our traditional breeds would be classed as early maturing, then what that means really is that if you can imagine this yellow line coming down faster, they, mat they mature earlier. This, this, this graph is, is tighter and the green line might go up just a little bit steeper. Yeah. To achieve that same carcass composition, that, that correct proportion between fat and lean, we've got to kill them or slaughter them at an earlier stage of maturity. So, so perhaps, you know, somewhere just a little bit further along to the left to achieve that carcass composition. We can manipulate this. There are things you can do to 
maximize this. But from a genetic point of view, you know, you, you, the genetics are set down in the breed of the animal. And the best that we can do is to feed as precisely as possible so that when the animals are young, we're giving them enough calcium to lay down the bone, we're giving them all of those essential amino acids, making sure there's enough methionine there and enough lysine there so that they can achieve this yellow line, making sure that that, that amount, that protein to energy ratio is, is correct, it's not too high, and we'll touch on that in a minute, but that, that at this stage, not overfeeding energy, not overfeeding something that will get laid down as fat. For some of the traditional breeds which start to have sort of lay down fat earlier in their maturity, there's, there's a couple of things we can do just to try and hold them back. And one of the things is to make sure that we're feeding to this yellow line, that we're actually feeding to meet those protein requirements and perhaps slightly higher as well. If you're feeding a commercial feed, if I showed you the list of commercial feeds, the commercial feeds are designed to follow that yellow line. Yeah, the protein and the lysine content are designed to meet that yellow line. If you're feeding a more, if you haven't got the option to feed all those different ones and you're maybe just going to feed one or two diets, then it's very much a, a compromise to, have I done a slide? Something like this here. If you're feeding a, a sow wiener grower, for example, and then a grower finish a diet, you're not able to follow that yellow line quite so well. And what you end up doing is overfeeding protein in this later stages, possibly underfeeding a little bit here and overfeeding protein in these later stages. Overfeeding protein means you're feeding too much nitrogen, which means that it takes energy to excrete the nitrogen. But it also means from a pollution point of view that you are excreting excess nitrogen into the environment because the animal couldn't utilize that extra protein. So we're, we're trying to follow that yellow line as close as we can, not underfeeding, because that's when you get potentially overfat carcasses, but not underfeeding either, because, no, sorry, not underfeeding, because that's when you get potentially fat carcasses, but not overfeeding because it's a waste and because it's potentially a pollution problem as well. Whereas, so the more, the closer you can hit that line, the more efficient your feeding will be. And um, if, if you think about the pigs who helped themselves, what they were actually doing was following that line. So we're looking at the lysine to digestible energy ratio. Okay, when, and what, that's what we're trying to do to achieve that correct ratio at all times between the yellow line and the green line. And potentially this, this black line here, for example, is just the point where the, the protein to energy, the lean to fat is just the right carcass composition. In, in an earlier maturing breed, that line might end up being a little bit further this way. Genetics, the environment, temperature, for example, if they're using energy for um, heat production, then potentially they're not going to use it for deposition. Market prices, you know, it's a to, to slaughter them earlier means they're smaller, so you don't get the total weight. And it's all just that that act between whatever is the right conditions for you. OK, again, you can actually we have key lysine to DE ratios. Yeah, they are. We, we know them from commercial breeds, for example, and I'm going to show you an example in a minute of a grower feed, feeding to 30 to 60 kilos. We're looking at an ideal lysine content of 1.05% and a total energy content of 13.3 megajoules of energy, giving us an overall lysine to DE ratio of 0.8. In order to achieve that, you could slightly increase this lysine percentage. That would just give you the edge on that yellow line, just to make sure without overfeeding that you're just hitting that 
genetic potential for lean tissue growth and making sure that you don't go above this, this requirement for energy. We can, so carcass composition manipulated by limiting energy during growth. If you want a very lean carcass, you can keep that energy down, making sure you're not overfeeding it. We can slaughter earlier. If you want a very lean carcass, you can slaughter earlier, but then of course they're going to be smaller. You could use later maturing animals, more commercial breeds, take them up to a higher body weight and they'll, they will be at the correct carcass composition at a, a later maturing stage. You can genetically select the most, um, the, the, the most later maturing animals within your uh, breed. Um, and there are some um, things you can do around castration where castrated boars are, the, are actually the, the, the ones that mature earliest compared with gilts and uncastrated boars. Okay, so what I want to just... Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Victoria, I've got a couple of questions. Um, okay. So I've got, um, what crude, crude protein is best for a grower? Okay, so... And I did say that it may slot in in a second, if that's one of our, one of our um, elements on the table. OK, so what I would say, crude protein, round about 18, but it's not really the crude protein that we're looking at. It's the lysine content, because you could have crude protein of 24%, but the lysine content could be very low, in which case you're just going to overfeed those non-essential fatty uh, essential amino acids. So it's not, the crude protein is really just a sort of a general measurement of the amount of amino acids in the diet, but it doesn't really give you an indication of the, the quality of those amino acids, um, and in particular, those key essential amino acids. Lovely. Okay, so I just wanted, uh, this is just the final five minutes or so. What I thought, I put together a little spreadsheet here. This is a little, tiny little ration programme, okay, that would be looking at some of these key factors that I've been talking about. And here you can see at the bottom that we are aiming, we'll say this is a grower feed, aimed for between 30, 60 kilos. And as I've just said, we're looking for a lysine to DE ratio of 0.8%. That's what gives us that, that carcass composition of just the right fat to lean. OK, and so what I've done, I just looked at things like protein and a couple of other factors, but we looked at lysine and methionine and, and energy content as well. And that line there is your standard pig grower ration. It's got a lysine content of, well, that's as a proportion of the protein. So it's that one we're talking about there. It's 1.05. It's got an energy content of 13.3. Just what I just showed you in that slide where we're looking at these key targets for lysine to DE. And you can see there that the ratio is exactly what we need. It's 0.8%. OK, so the commercial diets are beautifully balanced. It will have essential fatty acids in it and B vitamins and zinc and all of those things as well. But just looking at this, perfectly balanced. But let's say we decided our pigs love the bread or the vegetables, if you like, from the uh, bakery that Andrew mentioned earlier. But let's say, for example, we, we, we supplement that with some bread. And remember that they're, they're going for the energy content first. They're, they're feeding to eat their energy requirement first. So they're not going to overeat energy. If I just change this so that, let's say this diet has now comprised of 5% bread and 95% of the commercial feed, just because that's how much we've happened to feed, you can see doesn't sound like a lot, but you can see what it's done to that lysine. That lysine has dropped from 1.05, 1.06 it was actually, down to 1. And it's increased that energy content. Maybe not by much, but look what it's done to that ratio. It's dropped that ratio from 0 0.8 down to 0 0.75. And that's when you start to have excess energy or limiting essential amino acids, limiting lysine, so you can't achieve that yellow line. Excess energy, so the green line goes up quicker. And that's when you start to get 
that, that fatty carcass composition. If we were to look at vegetables, Andrew mentioned vegetables, vegetables aren't quite a bad because there's not really anything in vegetables, is there? You might get slower growth overall, but you maybe wouldn't get too much of a, a change. It's slight, slightly lower. Um, it has dropped the lysine content significantly, but it's also dropped the energy content as well. So in, they're going to grow slower, but they won't have that sort of imbalance so much in the, the protein to energy ratio. Things like bread, cakes, etc., are have a much bigger impact because the protein is very low, but the energy is very high, and it just exacerbates that differential. So, I'm sure the pigs like bread, or donuts, or things like that. So, if if you are going to supplement with those kind of things, then there's ways of counteracting that by, for example, maybe adding some soya. So you can buy bags of soya from your local um, store, your local farm shop. And let's say we just stick, uh, let's have a look, 92. Yeah, let's, let's say even 2.5% soya, something like that. I've had this all set up before, you know, which isn't a lot, is it? But you can see just by adding a little bit of soya, little bit soya back to that diet, we've brought that lysine back up and we've brought that ratio up to nearly 0.8 again. Balance the, the essential amino acids through a, a little bit of soya that potentially you could just sprinkle on the bread. It's not a large amount, but it, it, it makes that huge difference in achieving that yellow line and achieving that final carcass composition at the highest weight that you can taking them to as high a weight as possible without letting them get too fat. And, you know, the same would go if somebody wanted to supplement with barley, for example, then you would find that barley had a similar effect as the bread, not quite as significant as the bread, but still low lysine, high energy, still potentially bringing down that lysine to DE ratio. But you could feed some peas, for example, and that would potentially bring it back up again. Remember as well all the time that you're feeding things like bread and vegetables and barley. You're also diluting the essential fatty acid content of the diet. You're diluting any minerals. So some of the trace elements, I mean, bread is fortified, so there would be certain trace elements in bread, but not all trace elements. Um, and certainly some of the, the B vitamins as well, that by, by even putting that 5% content of bread, you're then reducing the B vitamin content of this total diet by 5%. And even that can have small effects on, on that growth curve, on that yellow line. In, in, in trying to achieve that yellow line. So, you know, we talked about soya oil being a good source of essential fatty acids. Andrew mentioned about some people using vitamin and mineral supplements to make sure that they're not deficient if they are supplementing. There's lots of different options, but it's very much about whatever you do, whatever you're feeding them, it's very much about controlling this lysine content and then you know, maybe methionine as well, if you if you want to go that little bit further as the, the second essential amino acid. Managing that energy content as well. So that you don't let that green, let me just flick back to my last slide there, so that you don't let that green line go up too early or you don't let that yellow line come down in that way, which then has that effect of an overfat carcass or having to slaughter at an earlier weight than you would you could have had and not maximizing the genetic potential of the animals okay and i think that's it so are there are there any more questions that we can have a discussion about 
Um, can I just ask a, a question? Something that sort of, uh, sorry, Chris Impey, and apologise for earlier. I had my phone going on my laptop. I managed to connect eventually. Um, can I just ask a question? I, I, I didn't hear anything specifically in relation to um, any of the individual breeds. Um, because as we know, different breeds had, uh, uh, were originally bred to do different things. For example, the Berkshire was bred to be a lightweight porker, so it it mm. reaches killing weight in a lot faster time um, than other breeds. And, um, you know, there was a debate that happened recently where people were poo-pooing somebody for uh, ad-libbing up to slaughter weight. Um, and, uh, and and when you look at the cost, you know, if you can get a pig to the Berkshire, will get to slaughter weight in 16 weeks. And then if you compare the cost of that, of, of keeping that pig to six months to achieve the same um, killing weight, essentially, at the end of the day, you know, w w what's the better system to do it, you know? So uh, the breeds will have a big impact yeah. on all of those figures there. And I, I didn't really hear you talk too much about that. So um, if I had more time, I could have. I think it was more just to sort of this was just really to sort of give that overall um theory if you like about carcasses that the reasons why we end up with carcasses that are not perhaps as we would like them whether that's because they're too lean or too fat or just that we've had to slaughter at a lower weight but we could we could look at it that's something that we could talk more about i'm sure we could look at that yeah, I certainly think it would be useful because people need to understand that that different breeds will do different things um, and, and, you know, I, I appreciate what you're saying there. That's that's a, um, an overview of all the different breeds. Um, and yeah, maybe in time, you know, whether we can do those comparisons at some point, that would be useful because um, people need to understand that they will do and they will yeah. grow at different rates. So, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. OK, right, that's that's lovely. It, Thanks. It, it took me right back to my college days about 30 <laughs> years ago. So. <laughs> well, it's good that you hadn't forgotten it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I have um, jotted that down, Chris, for future meetings. Um, we've got one in the chat. Um, how do you reduce the nitrogen content whilst also still providing enough protein? So it depends very much on the ingredients in the diet. A commercial diet will be based on soya, but we can add synthetic amino acids to that. We can add a bag of lysine, a bag of methionine, a bag of threonine or tryptophan if you want to go that far, which allows us to reduce the overall protein content of the diet, but add the key essential amino acids that are generally lacking in soya-based diets. You can't do that in organic systems. If everyone's running organic systems, we're not allowed to use synthetic amino acids. And therefore, we tend to have to feed much higher levels of crude protein in order to achieve those minimum lysine and methionine requirements. Um, we can feed fish meal, which does have a higher level of lysine and methionine and essential amino acids. And that allows us to feed less crude protein and still achieve those minimum requirements. Lovely, I hope that's answered your um, question, Bex. Um, we've got a question from Andrew around apples. Um, uh, apples are often considered a, s a staple in later seasons from smallholders. How do they factor into growth? Apples would be worse than vegetables because they will have a sugar content. They'll be low protein, but they will have a sugar content higher than vegetables, for example. So probably not as bad as bread, but would still skew the line. Um, I guess they probably have um, some decent vitamin content as well. But you would still be, by, depends on what proportion, I mean, one or two apples is not going to make a difference, but depending on the proportion, you're still going to be lowering the, the lysine content and increasing the energy content. Maybe not to the same degree that the bread would make, but still yeah. it would still have that effect. Thanks, Victoria. The only reason I ask is you quite often see is a lot of people sort of saying, "I've got a big, I've got a big bag of windfalls here. If anyone wants them for their pigs, and you see people feeding, you know, half a bag of, you know, 
basically, um, you know, um, that's what I'm looking for, fermenting apples to their pigs, you know, and stuff mm-hmm. like that. You know, and like I say, I mean, I feed them excess ones to my goats. It's good for sort of training, but I wouldn't sort of use it as a staple. But I just wonder what the sort of, you know, because it is very high in fructose, but yeah. there's not, not much glucose. But um, yeah, thank you. And just to stem on from that, the other one that I see quite often people asking about is, you know, the spent brewer's grain. So if you go to a brewery, you can get the excess grain that's been used for brewery, and quite a lot of people feed that. And I believe it also goes into a lot of the industrial process to create the commercial feeds. You know, I mean, is is that something? Is there any benefit from people getting that just because it's cheap and free? You know, I mean, is it? Is there any benefit, or, or are we just wasting our time on fuel and, uh, like you say, giving them energy and not giving them the ability to convert, you know, yeah. proteins to muscle? I think with Brewers Greens, that's probably not not so imbalanced. There's just not a lot of protein or energy in Brewers Greens. All the starch is being removed to go make beer, and what you're left with really is just the fibrous husk and and a little bit of protein, but. They're very, they're very fibrous. They're very bulky. They're, they're not really. I think if you looked at a commercial diet, you might be looking at two and a half, five percent maximum of distillers or brewers' grains being incorporated into that, because it's kind of just taking up space, really. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like, it's, it's not something I've ever done, but you know, it's just. Uh... But I think that they like them, don't they? They, they do definitely. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, so, for a treat. <laughs> Yeah, so, but yeah, in limited quantities, I would say. So, and, and one final question for me, obviously, this is all about um, nutrition growing for optimum carcasses and going off for meat. You know, where does the, you know, I'm not expecting you to go into too much detail now, where do we sit in, um, you know, feeding gilts and sows and for breeding and obviously boars as well are obviously a big factor because they're a big, they're a big sort of cost to keep, you know, I mean, with a boar, is it more about you know feeding in the the stuff to fill them up rather than keep them happy, you know, rather than the protein or and, and vice versa for sows and gilts? Yes, yeah, so it's a bit like the dry sows. So making sure that they have enough protein and energy to maintain a healthy body weight, making sure they're certainly given all the correct vitamins and minerals required for fertility, but not letting them get too fat. Same with the dry sows. And that was what I said about somehow some dry sows are the only ones where because you're restricting feed intake, where they might get hungry and you can give them sugar beet or straw or something that will fill them up without putting too much energy in. Thank you, Victoria. I appreciate your input on all my questions. I'm going to be I'm going to be quiet now and I'll, I'll, I'll let someone else ask some questions. Thank you very much. And I think we're probably just about out of time. So if anyone has got any more questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat box by all means. Um, I think Emily's going to put another little sort of poll out there or questions that, you know, if there's anything that, just like Chris said, that we could look further at. Um, anything that I've said, that was very much an overview. If you want to look at any of those aspects in more detail in the future, then of course we can. Lovely. Yes, thank you so much, Victoria. Um, so you're still sharing your screen. Just so oh, right. I shall there. disappear. I, shall, <laughs> I, won't, I won't pull up anything, um, any bank accounts. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I've taken a couple of um, notes for sort of future um, topics. Uh, I've got feed hygiene and sort of more than the specific breed route mm-hmm. if there's anything else that um people are really interested in pop it in the comments um in the chat box and i'll um pop them all together and it might be that we do a bit of a poll on facebook to see um you know which which would be sort of best to bring up next time and go into more detail um thank you ever so much again and i will hand over to marcus now for the bpa update and i I'm sure Marcus will prompt me for that poll. Thanks, Emily. We're going to do the question on housing. It's just loading, sorry. And what about your colleague talking about the map? 
Would you like that now, or would you I like that, that after? Would, I think that would lead on quite nicely from you know from the abattoirs into the into the housing pole. If, if you've got the housing pole up already, we can do that first. I can do either or. Tom, are you available to do um, your abattoir piece now? Uh, I can jump in at any time, so happy, happy to do whenever. Let's do that first then. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, inter I'll, I'll swap things around a bit then. Um, this is Tom. He's um, from our, um, he's a data field and GIS manager um, for HDB. That's the so, one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So if you'd like to do a bit of a, um, a bit more into what you do, Tom, and then lead on to the map, that'd be perfect. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm hoping not to get any interruptions because I believe the boys are in bed, so good timing. Um, I, I do work within central services at AHDB, so that includes finance, IS and levy. Um, I am actually positioned within our levy team as the data field and GIS manager. So uh, it, as it is in the title, I look after our levy collection data, our field operations and also the GIS um, aspect that covers all, brings it all nicely together. So GI, GIS is a geographic information systems, so maps. Um, I was asked kindly to put a proof of concept together regards to a supply chain map looking at abattoir locations um, and potential to producers being able to search for abattoirs within a distance from their location or a set location where and finding if there was um, any capacity nearby to, to take their their livestock to. So I jumped straight into to the, the, the show and tell as such. So can you can you see that guys? Yep. Brilliant. Yeah, that's great. So again, this is a proof of concept that was put together in a short space of time to showcase to others in the industry that there is a potential for something to be done internally at HDB rather than it being uh, outsourced to another partner. So what you have is a, a map of GB. Obviously, HDB for livestock only covers England, but we are looking to uh, work with our counterparts um, of QMS and uh, HCC. The, the coloured dots on the map represent abattoirs and they represent um, key, key abattoirs in the UK that are in England, sorry, that are paying a levy to a HDB. This is historic data. So some of the names may have changed and some of the abattoirs may have closed and some of the abattoirs and some new abattoirs may have appeared. The, the, the idea of the map was again so you could search a location um, and see what was available to you nearby. So on the map there is the take me to my location. So as you can see, um, I live in sunny Coventry here in the Midlands. Um, it is a beautiful part of the world and I'm in North Coventry. That is pretty much on my bang on my location. Yep, there we go. This is my house here. And the idea is you can set your distance ring. So how far are you willing to travel? If you want to travel a set distance, 42 miles is your limit. You can set the distance and it will then tell you what you have nearby. You can then apply a filter. So if you are specifically wanting to take pigs, you can apply a filter for pigs. It will then show you again what is within that region taking pigs. The idea is later on we'd like to add further filters for specific criteria, so private kill and added services, retail, cutting, so on and so forth. That is the show and tell bit over. It is, it is what it is. It is relatively simple. Um, I should hope it serves a purpose for industry if people would like it to and if they do we can look to getting something put together on a more solid front rather than it just being a proof of concept and if you want to remove any filters you purely click the untick and then it will show you everything 
that is it from me. Um, apart from we would also like to add satellite imagery like you do have with Google. Um, again, that is something that can be added and I have added on a second proof of concept, but I haven't updated the, the, the code to bring through onto the live map. There we go. Thank you ever so much, Tom. Has anybody um, got any questions surrounding the um, sur surrounding the um, concept so far? Yes. It's oh, so. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Andrew. Andrew again. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, I like the look of it, you know, from a map perspective. Is it? You know, they were talking about satellite views and stuff like that. Well, I mean, just wondered if there was any thoughts to leverage Defra and their magic maps that's already there to show holding markings and stuff like that for the interface opposed to creating something new. Just a question, not a criticism. Uh, Defra have seen this map. There was no there was no conversations about involving magic map. I have I have seen that. Um, it is a dated product, is it not? Or I don't believe it's updated that frequently anymore. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I believe magic's based upon land registry and ordnance survey maps. So you know, because you, the only reason I asked is you were talking about, um, you know, uh, satellite image overlay, so you can sort of see where you're going. And like when you go to Google, if you want to try and find something, you can go to street map view and see where you want to go and and know where you're going to sort of sort of get to. Like I say, it's not a criticism; it was just a question as to where the thoughts were around the tools that were driving that. I mean. Is, is it something that we can, you say it's a proof of concept, is it something that, that we're able to request access to, to have a look at, or is it pretty much something that's sort of in-house at the minute? It's in-house at the minute. It, it's it's kept internally, obviously being a proof of concept. Um, I'm more than happy to spend time on share like we are today to go through it and, and take feedback. If there's ideas you would like to put into such a product, um, I would say feed that back into to Emily or, or colleagues at HDB and we can take note of where um, people would like to see a tool um, or embedded in other products. Um, the, again, the idea is, is that we'll be able to add more data to it, not just abattoirs. Um, no, I, I, I think numbers is one. I mean, one of the challenges I had when I first moved to, to my holding was trying to find a, you know, a, a, a slaughterhouse and you sort of try and Google it and because of you know, a lot of the information is, is sort of hidden because they don't want it to be found mainstream because of protesters and yep. you know vegetarians and stuff like that. It was quite hard to sort of find somewhere. But once you sort of found somewhere and knew people, you were able to sort of, you know, see what was around and what the options kind of were. And you know, I still think that's an issue today. So I think the map's a great idea. Um, you know, and uh, hope to see it sort of grow and become more publicly available. Hopefully, in the uh, in the uh, medium to long term. To, in going back to your point around Google, what what I'm hoping to do is add a direction button. So when you say if you're on your your smartphone, your iPhone, your Samsung, whatever device you have, or your iPad, you would be able to click get directions. We've got the functionality within the map, but it's a printout version, which is you, which is good for some parts of industry. But other parts where you do have a smartphone and iPhone, you'd be able to click get directions and you'd open up your preferred routing uh, navigation system, Google, Waze, Apple Maps, whatever mm. it may be. And then it's predefined the route for you. So you could put it in your holder, connect it to your car, your, your, your van, away yeah. you go. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I think it's a great concept, you know, and it's a, I think it's something that's, you know, sort of, you know, like you say, when you go to Google, you can find your nearest McDonald's and all this kind of stuff, but you can't really, you can't find your local abattoir. So I think <laughs> I, I I think it's a good it's a good niche that you found, and you know I you know I look forward to seeing what comes out. Thank you. No worries. Lovely. Um, that's I think that's answered your um, question, Harry, as well. Um, this is brilliant. Do we have a link for this? So not quite yet <laughs> is the answer to that one. Um, so unfortunately, but hopefully soon. Um, so thank you so much, Tom. I think that's that really um, good point as well. It may be that we um, do a bit of a session um, on 
feedback or um, what have you in the sort of short to long, short to medium term um, after this evening and and see what the interest is and what people would like as well, seeing as we're at that sort of, we're able to certainly at the moment. So that's yeah. great. And if there's interest, we can we can make sure it's on the radar internally um, and yeah. make sure we can try and get a product out to industry that works. Perfect. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. Lovely. So I will um, pop over to Marcus now and I believe um, I'm going to launch the next poll. Okay. There you are, Marcus. So it's just gone out now. So if you'd like to do a bit, um, start your... Okay, so there's a poll up here asking uh, people, uh, when you send your pigs off to the abattoir and you fill out your movement license, there's a question about controlled housing or not controlled housing. And it'd be very helpful if everybody on the call could uh, could indicate which one of those boxes they tick. Or if you don't know, then please use the don't know. And that's a very interesting comment there in the in the box, and we'll come on to that in a sec. So have we got any results, Emily? So we've got three votes so far. Um, and well, don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, they are anonymous again. I, I yeah, it's will, all anonymous. I will stress that so nobody can see. Uh, you know, we can't, we're not able to see what people. Um... Yes, of course, if you don't have any pigs yet, then you won't be able to vote. So okay, you, well, look, are you able to see to... the results there, Marcus? Uh, no, they're not coming up. OK, so we've got 30, so three votes, uh, essentially one person's controlled housing and two don't know. OK. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming out this evening and uh, and giving up your time for these uh, these meetings. It's uh, great to see you all, especially in this this Teams format, which is a lot more friendly, I think, than the uh, than the webinar. I hope uh, I hope everybody else feels the same way. And um, I, th I thought that presentation from Tom was great. I think the point is that you know we or you rather as levy payers, small scale levy payers. It would be very helpful if you give feedback from this meeting to say, yes, you know, that looks great. We'd really like to have that. And then that way, hopefully, uh, AHDB will uh, uh, spend the money and actually produce it for us. Because I, I got the impression from you that um, you think it would be very useful. And it certainly seems that it would be useful to me. And then we can influence what kind of information is in there. So we can ask it to say, well, you know, do they do private kills? Um, all, all the things that we want to know that the larger scale producers might not be interested in. So anyway, moving on to uh, this bit, I talked a little bit about trichinella and controlled housing at the uh, at the last the last meeting, and I wanted to expand on it a bit more. So trichinella, well, this is the um, the parasite that um, uh, that's found in can be found in pig meat, and it's the um, it's the reason that people always say, "Oh, you know, you must uh, you must have pork uh, well done." So it's really not very common. Um, these slides are from the Food Standards Agency, so I'm using their whole slides without editing them down. But I'm not going to go through all of this in in great detail. I'm just going to pick out the highlights. The point is, the last person to uh, to actually get sick from trichinella uh, from eating. Uh, uh, UK pork uh, was back in the 50s, but it is found very, very occasionally, but it's very rare, but there are laws about it that we have to follow. And why is it important? Well, I think the key point about this slide is that last piece of the text there, parasite can live in human tissue for 40 years. So you really, we don't 
<laughs> we really don't want people to get this, uh, to get infected with this. And although in most cases, I mean, it's quite common in, in some developing countries, and mostly it's not a very serious problem, but it can be very serious. So in the acute and chronic stages, it can have some very nasty consequences. So it's not something that we can just dismiss it and say, well, oh, it doesn't matter. So what is all this talk about controlled housing conditions? Well, in order to be sure that, uh, that the pork doesn't have, uh, have trichinella, uh, the carcasses have to be tested. And clearly we'd rather not do testing on 10 million slaughter pigs a year. So within the legislation, it's possible to avoid testing pigs if they come from what's called controlled housing. And that's that box that you tick on your movement license. So how do we determine what is controlled housing and what isn't controlled housing? And that's covered by uh, a complicated regulation. It's an EU regulation that was carried over into, uh, into GB law after Bre uh, over Brexit. And there are various conditions that are uh, requirements for, uh, for controlled housing. For example, uh, B, there, you have to have a pest control program. Or D, uh, the feed has to be stored in closed silos or containers that are impenetrable to rodents. But the one that we want to look at uh, most carefully is I. None of the domestic swine has access to outdoor facilities unless you can complete some sort of risk assessment. Now, virtually all small-scale producers, I think, would have their pigs with some sort of outdoor access. They wouldn't be kept entirely in closed concrete buildings. So how are we going to deal with this, um, this risk assessment? And that's what FSA have, uh, have undertaken. They've undertaken to develop a risk assessment tool that um, uh, auditors can come to the, when they're doing, uh, doing farm inspections can use to determine whether your farm meets controlled housing conditions or not. And the tool's based on the transmission pathway. So uh, you've got the main sources being infected wildlife and infected rodents, and they can contaminate the feed. Or you might have pigs that are already infected coming onto the farm. If they contaminate the feed, that goes through feed intake. Also, the rodents and the wildlife, the carcasses of those might get eaten by the pigs. There's also this um, possibility of kitchen waste. Well, we all know that that's illegal, so clearly uh, that's not going to be an issue. But all of those things can lead through to, um, to uh, the infection of the pigs on the farm. And then it looks at how these can be controlled. Well obviously feed storage and the source of the feeds. Um, the feeding hygiene, you know, is the feed, um, when you've actually put it out, is it then exposed to, uh, to other animals? How's the rodent control program? Um, what, what sort of bedding are you using? Have you got good, uh, good fencing and so on? And the way the model works, it looks at five key areas. So housing, pig feeding, rodent control, pig management, and wildlife. And this looks very complicated. The key message here is the bottom three in the second uh, column in, rodent control, pig management, and wildlife, they make up 70% of the risk. And housing and pig feeding only represent 30% of the risk. So in order to pass the test, you've got to have very good rodent control programs, pig management, and some element of, uh, of uh, wildlife control. The, uh, the questionnaire, the, the risk assessment uh, questionnaire has 26 questions in it in total. And these will be available uh, for people to, to look at in future to get some idea of uh, how it might work for them. And at the end, you come up with a score. So those scores there, they, you, could, uh, you could just as easily put those as percentages, you know, 5% or 6 to 25% or 26 to 50%. So the first one there, 
If you get a score of 5%, negligible risk, that's controlled housing. And it says there 10% testing. There's a minimum requirement across the whole country for us to do 10%. But all cull sows and cull boars are tested already. That's a government program. And that tends to take care of the basic 10% that we need to do, along with uh, various testing that's done for, uh, for exports. The next category, low risk, 6 to 25%, that's still controlled housing. Moderate risk, 26 to 50, that's not controlled housing. And you would have to declare that on your, uh, your movement license to the abattoir, and then they'd have to arrange to have the carcasses tested. The testing's paid for by the government. So the abattoirs don't have to pay for the testing. They just have to hand over the samples. The courier comes and picks it up and takes it to a government a lab that has the government contract and does the test. Over 50%, that's a high risk. And again, you're not controlled housing and all the carcasses would have to be tested. In that moderate risk band, if you were just sort of around the 27, 28 percent you might be able to do some improvements and then uh, get yourself down into the uh, into the low risk band but i have a go at a couple of you know just answering a, a handful of the uh, of the key questions like um, pigs have access uh, outdoor access for more than 75 percent of the time um, they have straw bedding they drink from water troughs i don't have a program for shooting foxes and that sort of thing. And that already would take you into that, um, that low risk category. And you remember early, we said the rodent control was very highly weighted. So if you have that, that sort of management system on your farm, you'd then have to have an extremely good rodent control program to avoid going into the, uh, the moderate risk and not being controlled housing. So it's possible that some people at the moment, we saw a comment there where somebody said, well, it depends what the abattoir asked me to put. At the end of the day, it's you, the producer, that has to say whether you're controlled housing or not. And the will, uh, as, we, as we sort of move on from Brexit, there's likely to be more auditing of this. And so it may be that uh, people will have to change their status from controlled housing to non-controlled housing. So what we'd, what we'd like to get a feel for, just uh, ahead of this really is, you know, what reaction will you get from your abattoirs if you were to change from controlled housing to not controlled housing? And so maybe next time you're at the abattoir, just ask them, you know, well, what uh, what their reaction would be if you had to change and if they had to test your carcasses. And uh, if we could get that sort of feedback, you can either email me direct about it or we might send around a poll um, based on uh, all the people that have registered for these uh, these meetings and carry out a bit more research. So, so the main point about this is if there's going to be a problem, we want to know, know about it in advance so we can talk to government about how to uh, mitigate that and make sure that, that um, a sort of more thorough implementation of this regulation doesn't lead to problems for small scale producers getting access to abattoirs. Uh, Marcus, uh, Andrew O'Shea, another question from me. Um, Sure, Andrew. I mean, I mean, I've asked this question a couple of times, not of yourself, of of other organisations. They couldn't provide any detail. I think this is a, I think this is fantastic information that you've provided. Um, you know, I can say I'm not going to name the abattoir, but you know, a lot of these small scale abattoirs that don't have a lot of space, they want these carcasses sitting around for an extra couple of days before they go to sure. a butcher because they're getting trichinella testing because every, you know, every chain that's hanging up an animal is money to them and if a pig's there for two days extra because they're waiting for the result of the trichinella before it's released you know um you know that's potentially an issue for them um in their turnover obviously the likes of the large-scale producers it, it's it's not a problem for them you know, they've got plenty of storage space you know and a, a carcass or two from a small scale producer is not not really a challenge um 
So I, th I, th I think it's great that you got this information, Marcus, because I've been asked this a couple of times, and uh, no, you know, and I asked this of uh, EAML specifically about the question on the sheet, and no one could actually ask the question as to what you know control versus non-control would be. It was really an interpretation of what you saw, and when it comes down to rodent control plans, and there are you know the laws changed in 2016 around you know, the poisons you can use, secondary effect, because they're affecting birds and wildlife, and you're supposed to have other plans in face, in place first, you know, fen traps, shooting before you use poisons, etc. So, um, all very interesting. So, I, I, ju I just wanted to say thank you. It's, a, it's a, yeah, some useful information. Yeah, you're right, Andrew. I mean, that's definitely one of the issues. When, when this first came in, that was one of the issues, and that's why we're worried about the fact that you know, more a tighter regulation on this will bring those issues back again. So let's try to get ahead of the game, find out what the problems are, and then we can talk to government. Clearly, there's a risk balance here. You know, if nobody's caught this disease since uh, since 1950, 1953, I think, or something like that, and the risk is increased by having pigs outdoors, giving them straw bedding, and all the things that people want us to do as pig keepers, that's what people would like us to do, then, you know, there has to be, you know, some uh, sensible approach to this so that we don't end up not being able to do those things because the abattoirs can't uh, can't deal with storing some carcasses. So this is very early days. Yeah. But, you know, let's get some feedback from abattoirs about how they actually feel and what they see the problems are so we don't get caught out if suddenly they roll this program out and then uh, and then we find that um, the abattoirs can't take our pigs that's uh, i don't want to be alarmist about this i just want to no, uh, to make sure that we're 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 ahead of the uh, ahead of the game i mean and i don't take it that way i mean one of the questions that you sign off on the um declaration when you go for slaughter is that whether the animals come in contact with anything that could be um you know have a residue in the meat, you know, and I think more that's more prudent for people that have their pigs out in a, you know, backyard in a backyard or farm or move it around in woodland and stuff like that. Especially when you've got people that have small holdings where the public walk past and can throw stuff in to feed the pigs. I've, I'd have said that was a bigger risk than, like you say, trichinella. That we say we well, have you're case you're absolutely right. That's that's actually one of the questions, you know. Yeah. Are there, do you have footpaths and have you got measures in place to um, to uh, stop the public feeding your pigs? That's um, yeah. That's one of the questions in this risk tool. But um, you know, let, let's uh, let, let's keep keep this under review and um, uh, make sure that uh, that we're ready for it uh, if and when it yeah. uh, if and when it comes. Uh, um, I'd also thank you. Very useful. I'd, very briefly, I'd just like to, to talk about um, a breeders meeting program that we, the, that we're, the BPA are running um, over the next uh, six weeks. And these are going to be individual uh, meetings like this uh, for each of the traditional breeds. We'll have some joint meetings for some of the, uh, the modern breeds. The idea of these meetings is we want to focus on uh, the conservation plans that we've published for this year for the native breeds. But we also want to look at long-term planning for the next five to 10 years. You know, what are our ambitions in terms of our conservation programs and so on? Where do we want to be at uh, the end of the 2020s? And so we're going to have um, one meeting for each breed. And there are some uh, provisional dates there, kicking off next week with the Barkshires and the Saddlebacks and then following on through with all the different breeds, uh, finishing up with the Mangalitsas uh, towards the end of May. So I do hope that um, any, uh, any of you who are BPA members will, uh, will join in with those meetings and uh, I look forward to having uh, a lot of discussions and interaction with, uh, with you and uh, members of the Conservation Committee and so on who will be there at the meetings to listen to what people have got to say and explain how you can uh, get involved in the conservation breeding programs. I mentioned earlier that you could email me about your uh, experiences with abattoirs and obviously anything you send me about uh, about the abattoirs, I guarantee to keep that uh, completely confidential. 
and uh, you can get me on bpa at britishpeaks.org. So thank you very much indeed for, the, for uh, giving me the time this evening. Lovely. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, so we have got one question quickly, um, and that is um, we have a dead stock removal yard less than 500 yards away. Um, will that affect our premises? And I think that was um, in relation to the um, risk assessment tool. Is that right, yeah. Harry? Yes, Harry. One of the uh, one of the questions is uh, one of the key uh, questions is about um, landfill and um, waste disposal sites. I imagine that it would fall under that, but these are the sort of questions that we will uh, we need to need to address. But most likely it would. I think it's two kilometres. I think without going back to the presentation. But if you drop me an email, I'll uh, I'll look at into it in more detail. Lovely. Thank you so much. I haven't got any more questions um, at the moment. Has anybody else got any that they'd like to come forwards with? OK. Um, so, yeah, so just just back over to me then um, to, to round up. Thank you ever so much um, to our speakers tonight again. Um, and we do have um, just a final slide. Um, at, like usual, we've um, if you've got any topic requests, anything following on from this evening um, that we'd like to look into, I've seen a couple of comments. Um, that's great. We take it away. Um, so we're always looking um, to what what you'd like to hear about. So that's great. If you let me know um, either by me from email or um, by mobile, that's fantastic. Um, if anybody has missed this evening's um, meeting, then we do have another next. We do have another running next Wednesday. Um, same lineup. So that's the 28th um, of April, and then our next round of um, meetings are on the 9th and 16th of June, and we'll be covering our meat education program. So that'll be looking more into our pork box scheme um, and potentially having a speaker. Um, you know, with their experience of um, of, of the program, uh, you can find this recording on the small scale um, pig keeping um, page, and you've also will have it on the um, BPA website. And then, lastly, um, we, I will be popping out a survey. It might not be from me. Um, I'm lambing at the moment, so it might be um, from a colleague. But everybody on the call will get a feedback um, email. Um, if you could just fill that out, that would be perfect. So we know um, if we're hitting the right spots or not. Um, so, yeah, thank you ever so much again. Just um, before you go, and, Emily. Yeah. Uh, can I just say to everybody on the meeting tonight, Emily's actually been in the lambing shed all day. So, you know, we're really lucky to have people at AHDB who are prepared to spend the day lambing and then do these evening meetings for us. So we really do appreciate it, Emily. Thanks very much. And for everybody, uh, everybody on the call, you know, these these meetings are, are, are your meetings. So please, you know, do make use of them and encourage. If you've enjoyed the meeting tonight, encourage other people that you know to come along and uh, and get the most out of it, because uh, you know AHDB are putting them on for us, and uh, uh, people like Emily are actually giving up their time to uh, to help us out. So thank you very much, Emily. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. I will. Um, yeah, we we'll leave it there. So um, I'll pop the we'll pop the recording round once it's finished processing, and we'll speak to you all soon. Hopefully, um, sooner rather than later. Um, and take care. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>